Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Tom Givens, and on behalf of Dean Peg Klein from the College of Leadership and Ethics and our Stockdale share, Chair, Dr. Pauline shanks Karin, I'd like to welcome you to the Leadership and Ethics Lou with our guest today, uh, Jim Zimwalt. Jim's going to talk to us about his father, Elmo Zimwalt, when he was a CNO. But before I turn the, the microphone over to Jim, I want to send a special shout out to all the Zumwalt family members and all the special friends that are here with us today from Stonehill College and Jim's friends from across the country that uh, are welcome. They're here. Welcome to the Naval War College's Leadership and Ethics, Lou. Uh, we're glad to have you. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my good friend, Jim Zumwalt. Well, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> and thank you everybody for joining us this afternoon. I, I think when uh, there are two aspects of my father's life, I'd say there's uh, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt Jr., the legacy, and Elmo, uh, Admiral Elmo Zumwalt Jr., the man. And while many people may be familiar with his legacy, it's uh, the man uh, aspect that I'd like to uh, focus on this afternoon. And I, I thought the best way to do this was maybe to take you on a journey and uh, share uh, vignettes uh, about uh, his life experiences and what really kind of molded him to be the kind of leader that uh, he evolved into. Uh, my father was born in 1920 in uh, San Francisco and uh, both his parents were medical doctors, which was very unusual in that day to have uh, a woman as a, as a medical doctor. But uh, I, I think that uh, the fact that both his parents were medical, author, uh, uh, medical doctors really uh, uh, imbued him with compassion for uh, other people. And uh, that was uh, uh, relevant throughout his uh, uh, military career. He uh, was uh, attending, they moved, they moved when he was two years old to Tulare, California, and he went to Tulare High School. He uh, was uh, actually all set to go to West Point. Uh, he had, uh, his father had served in the Army in World War I and would go on to serve in the Army as a doctor in World War II. Um, so my father had his heart set on uh, attending the uh, West Point. However, they, they had a family friend over for dinner one evening and he had spent a lot of time at sea and he shared these stories about life at sea with my father and my father became mesmerized by it and immediately asked that his uh, acceptance be transferred to the Naval Academy, uh, which back then was not much of a problem to do. And so uh, he went to the US Naval Academy. He was a class of 1943 that graduated in 1942. It was expedited because of the war. The, uh, the lucky book is the Academy yearbook. And the uh, first sentence of the paragraph that uh, uh, is seen beside his name, that, that each uh, graduate wrote a, a paragraph about uh, their roommate. And so uh, my father's roommate uh, wrote a paragraph about him. And the first sentence read, the two most important things in Bud Zumwalt's life were women and women. And uh, once my father got out into the Navy, that uh, quickly uh, changed. Um, uh, the two most important things being women and women to being his sailors and his sailors. And uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's faithful that uh, my father shares a common name with uh, the uh, patron saint of sailors, uh, St. Elmo. My, uh, my father uh, was immediately sent, upon graduation, was sent to uh, radar school and then assigned to a ship that was leaving San Francisco to go to Hawaii, and he was the radar officer on board the ship. He quickly learned on that uh, trip that uh, inexperience can cause uh, uh, some, uh, some problems. He, uh, they were about halfway uh, to Hawaii when uh, he heard over the loudspeaker uh, call by the captain for him to come to the bridge. My father came to the bridge and uh, radar was relatively new at that point in time. And the CO kind of was looking at the radar screen and was somewhat befuddled. Uh, and he was trying to understand what something on the screen was. My father looked at it and, you know, he couldn't make heads or tails of it either. And he said, well, I, I know we were told that there's a, uh, 
as a, uh, an astronomical anomaly that you can have that will you know create something like that. And so the CEO uh, nodded his head. And my father went down below. About 30 minutes later, the uh, loudspeaker went again, calling for my father to come to the bridge. He comes up to the bridge. As he comes up to the bridge, he looks out and he sees a convoy of ships heading in the other direction. And the CEO looked at my father and said, I just wanted you to see your goddamn astronomical anomaly. So uh, I, I think that was one of the few mistakes my father made in his uh, his uh, military career. He uh, went on to uh, uh, every bit of support he got in the Navy uh, was outstanding, except for the first one on that ship's tour. So he learned an important lesson uh, right away. Um, I think that there are good perceptions you can get of a man uh, when you listen to those who served under him. And uh, uh, shortly before my father died uh, at the turn of the century, he was sent a, uh, a story written by uh, Jason Hammer, who was a radar in third class who had served with my father on board the USS Robinson during World War II. And keep in mind, this is something that was sent to my father more than half a century afterwards. Uh, but it was, it was Hammer's account of his remembrances about my father. And uh, what he said was, uh, and I'll, I'll quote him several times uh, here this afternoon, but he, he said uh, of my father that uh, uh, both personally and as a leader in combat, quote, he was the epitome of what an intelligent, good humored and efficient naval officer should be and at the same time, one of the kindest and most considerate men it was my good fortune to have served with. A wonderful human being, deeply dedicated to equality and justice in word and deed for all. While naval protocol effectively stifled meaningful socializing between officers and enlisted men, both accepted it as a fact of life. We were shipmates in the sense that if something went radically wrong, we were all, regardless of rank, literally in the same boat. In any event, socializing with him certainly was not a prerequisite for recognizing that seemingly unflappable aura which seemed to surround him even under the most nerve-jangling circumstances. That calm command would have been memorable even to someone knowing nothing else about him beyond what they could observe. It left an indelible impression. Anyone dependent on another human being for leadership and in desperate need of some degree of assurance under hazardous conditions immediately will recognize the feeling. Here was a man from whom I repeatedly gained some measure of peace of mind. His quiet strength and obvious calm, whether during torpedo run, kamikaze attack, or retaliatory fire from hostile shore batteries, never failed to reassure me with his always observable control of any situation. Any miscalculations could spell disaster. In combat, <clears throat> strangely, I was not worried. Excited, yes, but not worried. In addition to a heavy sense of adventure, which seemed to shield me from the reality of the danger, I totally was reassured by the expected calm efficiency being displayed by the lieutenant. Lieutenant Zumwalt was showing his proven ability to transmit a quiet serenity to everyone around him. His voice always even, his actions always carefully considered and calm, regardless of the urgency of the situation. And the circumstances at hand certainly called for all the calm we could muster. I uh, think that's quite a tribute to be uh, remembered, um, as I said, more than half a century after the fact. And uh, I'm going to quote uh, Hammer again here because he gets into a very interesting uh, story that occurred uh, in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, which was a night action. And uh, he, uh, he said that USS Robinson was making uh, torpedo runs on the uh, Japanese battleships. The, uh, the Japanese eventually saw the, the destroyers coming in and they fired a shot overhead and a, a, a shot that fired uh, uh, fell low and they knew the next shot was coming for them. And uh, uh, by this time, the, the American battleships had gotten into position to uh, take on the Japanese battleships and open fire. So the Japanese uh, did not concentrate their fire on the destroyers. They turned it uh, on the battleships. But... Uh, the uh, 
during the McConney exercise, the, I mean, uh, during the, uh, the operation, the commanding officer of the destroyer had the con. He was driving the ship and he was also fighting the ship at the same time, directing fire. Uh, my father was in CIC and, and uh, he was watching on the radar, which he, he knew everything about the radar at this point in time. And uh, he could quickly see that the ship was approaching uh, an island and uh, was not changing course. And so, uh, uh, and this is Hammer again telling the story. He, sa he says he heard my father say, quote, on collision course with Little Hib Hibison Island, dead ahead, acknowledge, acknowledge. Uh, we were approaching the island at 30 plus knots uh, at approximately the rate of a half mile per minute impact what would accomplish what the Japs had failed to do. A collision at this speed with an accompanying boiler explosion would demonstrate very spectacular, uh, spectacularly why these ships were called tin cans. The lieutenant gave another desperate warning. Bridge, back all engines, em emergency full. Immediately, you are going aground. Finally, uh, the captain acknowledged from the bridge and immediately ordered all back engines. Hamburg uh, uh, was wondering whether or not the order had been given in time, and he looked to my father for reassurance. He says, quote, his words were electrifying and anything but comfort comforting. Hang on, this is it, he said. Based on numerous past experiences, if the lieutenant was certain, then I had no doubt whatsoever about the outcome. Sentence had been passed and we awaited the final moment. Hammer said he held, he held on to a steel pole and awaited, awaited the inevitable collision. Quote, I prepared myself as best I could for the inevitable impact and turned once again to the lieutenant fully expecting to see him carrying out his assigned duties right up to the explosive end. He indeed was doing just that, but frankly, I was not prepared for what I saw. I was looking at a tall, dignified, impeccably dressed naval officer in spotless pants, looking quite military and, uh, and proper in every way, except could this be? He had prepared for his own inevitable collision by pulling his hat down to the top of his ears with the bill resting slightly above the bridge of his nose. At least his vision was unimpaired, if not his dignified appearance. Under less ominous circumstances, I would be desperately trying to suppress an uncomfortable urge to laugh, but understandably the humor escaped me for the moment. Instead, it occurred to me as a fleeting thought that perhaps his last desire was to die with the dignity of his hat on." Unquote. He went on to say, quote, we felt the expected thud and ominous scraping beneath uh, our feet before easing to a total stop, followed by dead silence. And then the sounds of engines coming to vigorous life, straining to free the bow from the clutching coral. Robinson had survived and the lieutenant properly adjusted his hat. He concludes, I'm sure he was unaware despite that dramatic pronouncement of impending dancer disaster of my gratitude for once again supplying the quiet assurance I so often needed, especially on that unscheduled rendezvous with Little Hudson Island. Thanks, Admiral. Well done. My, uh, my father was awarded the Bronze Star in Combat B for heroic uh, service as evaluator in Combat Information Center in action against the enemy battleships during the Battle of Lake Kegel, 25 October, 1944. The uh, my father would go on to have his first command, the uh, Robinson, a uh, little while later captured, uh, in 1945, captured a uh, Japanese gunboat uh, coming out of the Yangtze River. And uh, my father and 10 sailors were put on board the, uh, the HIJMS Ataka as the prize crew. They were ordered to sail the ship back up the Yangtze River and my father was supposed to uh, uh, link up with Admiral Marion Miles, who was conducting guerrilla operations behind enemy lines. As they got up the, the river, the, uh, uh, they weren't sure where the mines were. And, and so my father uh, asked the Japanese commander for the mine charts. To mine, the Japanese commander would not turn them over. So my father had the Japanese commander and, and uh, his uh, sailors all go to the bow of the ship. So if they hit anything, they would be the first ones to suffer the damage. And uh, the Japanese commander started uh, uh, sweating beads and uh, finally broke out the mine chart. And so they were able to navigate up through the Yangtze River. Um, at one point, they uh, came abreast of a Japanese fort and uh, 
they uh, immediately hauled down the U.S. flag my father happened to have in, in his uh, CSAC. A, uh, a, he was a, quite a party goer, and, go, go and it, it was a, a flag with a cocktail glass on it. They hauled this flag up instead. And you can just see the Japanese looking through their inter international uh, flag book, trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what nationality the ship was. Well, they were they were able to skirt by the Japanese fort without them uh, taking them under fire. And uh, by the by the time uh, they got a little further on, the Japanese had finally surrendered, and and so my father's orders were changed to uh, take the ship into Shanghai and to help in the disarming of the Japanese. His ship became the first one flying the American flag uh, to sail into uh, to Shanghai, and uh, uh, they began the, the disarmament process. Within the next couple of weeks, uh, several other ships came in, and and uh, my father was approached by three of his Naval Academy classmates. Uh, they said that they had a invitation to a Russian home for dinner, and they understood there would be four single Russian girls there, and. Uh, they needed a fourth to uh, complete the uh, uh, their participation. My father, who had been at sea for two years, didn't waste any time, and he said, I'll join you. Uh, they uh, went to the party, and uh, uh, what I'm going to read you next is uh, from a 75-page letter that my father wrote, his father, when the war was over, that explained their uh, capturing the Japanese gunboat going up the Yangtze River, and uh, and uh, going into Shanghai and, and going to this uh, to this uh, dinner, and uh, you know I, I never realized my father was a romantic until I uh, I, I, I read this letter. But uh, he uh, he said the following. Um, he said, uh, "Quote: The four girls uh, entered the room. The first one was a gorgeous blonde, lithe and well formed, with a lovely soft complexion and an air of regality, almost aloofness." The second one entered and my heart stood still. Here was a girl I shall never be able to describe completely. Tall and well poised, she was smiling a smile of such radiance that the very room seemed suddenly transformed as though a fairy waving a brilliant wand had just entered the room. I never saw the remaining two girls. I, I don't know if that's accurate, but uh, that's, that's what he said. Uh, he met my mother on October 1st, 1945 he proposed on the 7th and they were married on the 22nd. And uh, he explained the reason it took him so long between the uh, 7th and the 22nd to get married was back then you had to get your commanding officer's permission. And his commanding officer had been married and divorced three times and tried uh, talking my father out of it, but uh, uh, to no avail. Um, in uh, March of 1951, my uh, father uh, reported on board the USS uh, Wisconsin, the battleship Wisconsin, and uh, he became navigator. Uh, the, the Wisconsin ended up serving in the uh, in three, three and war. Uh, an interesting story uh, about his service on the, uh, the Wisconsin. I, I look back and researched, there have only been two officers who were chiefs of naval operations who had career ending incidences that occurred in their junior years. Uh, the, uh, the one was Chester, uh, well, the first one was Chester Nimitz, who uh, was uh, ensign and commanding officer on board of a destroyer that went aground in the Philippines. He got a letter of reprimand, but obviously it didn't affect his career. Uh, in my father's case, he was on board the Wisconsin, which uh, went aground in uh, New York Harbor. And uh, as I said, that would normally end one's career. But uh, what had happened was uh, they were told to tie up in between uh, two buoys in the river. And my father became very concerned that the, the uh, currents were, were stronger than usual. And so he told the commanding officer who shared with his, who shared with his seniors that uh, the uh, ship was, was headed, hesitant to tie up there. And the, uh, they were informed that a carrier had been there uh, the week before and not to worry about it. Uh, my, uh, they tied up at the buoys and again, my father became very concerned and again told his CO who again contacted the, the uh, senior officer and the senior officer basically said, look, you uh, tie up there and that's it. 
they shut down the engines and my father remained on the bridge and kept taking uh, readings and noticed that they were drifting. The, the buoys were dragging. And sure enough, they, uh, uh, they went aground. Uh, there was a uh, board of inquiry and uh, the, uh, both my father and the uh, Manning officer were, uh, uh, the, the, the board determined that both of them had done everything that they could to prevent it. And so the only one that got a letter of reprimand was the senior officer who insisted that they, uh, they tie up there. The uh, commanding officer of the Wisconsin went on to make flag rank as well. So uh, they, uh, they both survived that. Um, there, there's a book that was uh, written entitled uh, in, Search of Ele in, in Search of Excellence. Uh, it was written by two authors who look at uh, the profiles of many leaders in, in corporate and uh, uh, governance and, uh, and look at what it is that made them effective leaders. And they one chapter goes into uh, uh, analyzing military leaders, and one of whom was uh, was my father. Um, and uh, there was a chapter entitled "Productivity Through People," and it notes that quote Zumwalt revolutionized the Navy's personnel uh, practices in just a few short years at the helm. It all stemmed from the simple belief that people respond well to being treated as grown-ups. He traces his beliefs back to an early command assignment. What I tried hardest to do was ensure that every officer and man on the ship not only knew what we were about, not only why we were doing each tactical evolution, however onerous, but also managed to understand enough about how it all fitted together that he could begin to experience some of the fun and challenge that those of us in the top slots were having. Our techniques were not unusual. We made frequent announcements over the loudspeaker about the specific event that was going on. At the beginning, at the end of the day, I discussed with the officers who in turn discussed with their men what was about to happen and what had just happened, what the competition was doing and what we should do to meet it. We published written notices in the plan of the day that would give the crew some of the color or human interest of what the ship was doing. I had bull sessions in the chief petty officer's quarters where I often stopped for a cup of coffee. More important than any of these details, of course, was the basic effort to communicate a sense of excitement, fun, and zest in all that we were doing. I think my father's uh, uh, leadership skills were really put to, to test in uh, July of 1955 when he took command of the USS Isabel, a destroyer that was one of uh, eight in, in a squadron. And uh, Isabel had a uh, horrendously bad reputation. It repeatedly uh, would uh, come in eight uh, out of the ship competitions. And uh, the, uh, the CO was, was finally relieved of command. Uh, my father took command of Is Isabel and within 18 months, uh, he was, uh, my father was commanded by, uh, commended by the commander of cruiser destroyer forces U.S. Pacific for winning the battle uh, efficiency competition for his ship and X awards in engineering, gunnery, anti-submarine warfare, and operations for two years in a row, going from eighth place to first place, quite, quite an accomplishment. Um, my father also shared that sometimes it's the little things that, that make a difference. He said, uh, quote, uh, he, he said he spent, quote, uh, inordinate amount of time on one element of seeming trivia, changing the ship's voice call sign. Uh, and he sought to do this based on the following rationale. Quote, since recently assuming command of Isabel, this CO, this is what he put in his request. Uh, this CO has been concerned over the anemic connotation of the present voice radio call sign. When in company with such stalwarts as Fireball and Viper and others, it is somewhat embarrassing and completely out of keeping with the quality of the sailors aboard to be identified by the relatively, relatively economous title Sapper. It took six months, but he was able to change the name to Hellcat. And, uh, it provided quite a morale boost for the, uh, the sailors on board. Uh, and they came up with a patch that showed uh, a black cat uh, stepping out of the, the flames of hell, uh, breaking a sub with its paws. Um, 
Another story I'd like to share about Isabel, that the first time the ship went out for nighttime operations, the, uh, there was a, a junior officer who was uh, officer of the deck and uh, they were operating with other ships. And my father came up to the bridge and noticed that a situation of extremists was developing and he waited as long as he could. The young officer was not taking action. So he said, uh, this is the captain, I have the con. And he navigated the ship out of uh, dangerous way. And the, the fellow, this story was shared with me by a fellow who was there on the bridge at the time. And he said, you know, we all expected at that point in time, your father would turn to the, to the officer of the deck and chew him up one side and down the other, which is basically what the previous CO would have done. But he said, your, your father did something at that point in time that reinstilled the confidence of every man on that bridge. He said, uh, your father uh, said, this is the captain. I'm turning the con back over to Lieutenant J.G. so-and-so. And then he left the bridge. So he wanted to show that he still had complete confidence in this officer. I, uh, I asked my father about that. And he said, yeah, but he had a sleepless night that night, uh, you know, worrying about what might happen. But he knew it had to be done to to uh, reinstill uh, motivation in this in this young officer, and incidentally, that young officer eventually went on to make flag rank, so uh, it uh, it paid off. Um, one other story worth noting: my father, uh, after a sea duty, was uh, sent to the Pentagon, and he was the uh, executive assistant to the uh, Secretary of the Navy, Paul Nitsa. And uh, this was during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The, uh, uh, my father was a captain at this point in time. And uh, he had gone to the men's room. He was just coming out of the men's room. And Secretary Nitsa was racing down the hallway, he grabbed my father by the arm, and he said, uh, Secretary McNamara wants to see us. So my father didn't have anything with him to take uh, notes on. And they rush into McNamara's office. And McNamara starts rattling off a list of things that he wants done. And he got about halfway through his list and he looked at my father and saw he wasn't taking notes. So he picked up a pad of paper and a pen and he threw it uh, on the floor in front of my father. My father didn't pick it up and uh, McNamara continued to rattle off his, his list of action items. When they were through, my father left, went back to his office and uh, prepared a memo and then took it in to, to the Secretary of the Navy and said, sir, I, I, here's a memo on the, on the issues raised by Secretary McNamara and Nitsa looked it over, said, well, by golly, he looks like he got everything. He said, it's a good thing he did. When you left, McNamara told me if he misses one thing, fire him. But uh, one thing McNamara didn't realize is that my father had a photographic memory and uh, was able to uh, come up with an acronym to remember all the things that had to be done. And uh, I guess that was reflected in the fact that we won the Cuban Missile Crisis. But uh, my father was in sele deep selected for a uh, two-star rank, becoming the, the youngest two-star admiral in the, in the history of the Navy. He uh, uh, was immediately assigned command of cruiser destroyer Flotilla 7. I was out there for about a year and, uh, and then was sent back to the Pentagon as director of systems analysis. And uh, he was the first director of systems analysis. And uh, it was a a job that uh, really put one in the in the firing line because you had to make decisions about funding and what was in the best interest of the service. And so uh, inevitably there was somebody who was losing out on funding and somebody who was not gaining. And the thing that was interesting is that uh, the CNO at the time was uh, Admiral Tom Moore. Uh, this was 1968 and Moore knew that within two years, he was going to be moved up to be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which meant that there would be an opening for chief of naval operations. And he became very concerned that uh, my father would be the one uh, to be selected for that because he was he was making uh, getting a lot of attention on Capitol Hill. And so uh, not wanting to displease Secretary Nitza, who was very high on my father, he uh, decided what he would do is give my father a what was considered a dead-end job, but boosted by a star to make it attractive. And so he sent my father out to command the naval forces in Vietnam, made it a, a position for a three-star admiral. My father uh, uh, 
became the youngest three-star admiral in the history of the Navy at that point in time, and uh, took command of the naval forces where uh, he uh, fell under the, the command of uh, General Abrams. Um, he, my father basically restructured what the Navy was doing, and uh, the Navy, for the most part, had been taking somewhat of a defensive uh, position in the war, and my father uh, gave them a, a more offensive-related uh, mission. And the results were shown by the fact that the uh, U.S. Army casualties dropped significantly once the Navy operations uh, were increased because they were interdicting supply lines of the uh, Viet Cong coming down south. And, uh, you know, my, my father really impressed uh, General Abrams. Well, by 1970, uh, lo and behold, the Navy was looking for a new chief of naval operations and Secretary Laird went out to, uh, to Vietnam to meet with Abrams. And uh, Abrams said, uh, uh, look, Mr. Secretary, you, you need to meet with Admiral Zumwalt because he's gonna bang up job here with the Navy. And uh, so he got, my father got Laird's attention at that point in time. And it was interesting, Moore sent my father out there to get him out of the running uh, for CNO. And that's exactly what put him in the running for CNO uh, uh, since Laird and Abrams were the both so impressed with him. And uh, uh, as everyone knows, he was then selected to become the Chief of Naval Operations who at age 49 became the youngest CNO in the history of the Navy. And uh, although the, the, the records he sent for his two and three star flag ranks had been broken by younger officers, the, the uh, age for uh, CNO at 49 still remains the, uh, the record. So, uh, so he still holds that. Um, of the three wars he, he was involved in, World War II, Korea, and, and Vietnam, my, my father was asked which one was the most difficult one. And he said it was the Vietnam War. And he said it was the first war where he was in a senior leadership position and he was not going into harm's way along with his, uh, his sailors. And, uh, you know, my mother reported how she was visiting my father once in Saigon and, and uh, she saw him go into a, a small room off their bedroom and, and kneel in prayer. Uh, and she asked him afterwards uh, what he was praying for. And he said, I, 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 I just sent some more young boys <clears throat> into harm's way. So I think he, uh, you know, his part of the compassion he had and humanitarianism he had was was driven by his uh, religious beliefs as well. Um, he said the the one thing he always felt guilty about uh, during the Vietnam War. My, my brother was a swift boat commander serving under his chain of command when he was over there. Uh, he, he never did anything that would uh, be considered improper or unethical and, and doing any favors for my for my brother. But he said the one thing he felt guilty about is whenever he got the casualty list, he would start at the bottom and uh, read up, uh, you know, because he knew if, if my brother had been lost, he would be at the bottom of the list. Uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing that I, I think is quite telling about my father, it, one of the problems uh, we, we learned about uh, mostly after the fact about our advisors for the Vietnamese during the war was their reluctance to consider their Vietnamese, South Vietnamese counterparts equals. And uh, there was always this tendency to talk down to them. My father developed a very close relationship with the uh, CNO of the, the South Vietnamese Navy, Admiral Chan. And uh, the two of them became very close. My, my father would always call him in whenever a decision had to be made and get his his input as well, and, and Admiral Chan felt very comfortable uh, uh, sharing it, uh, and being very honest with my father. And I think that the the friendship these two men uh, had was uh, reflected by the fact that uh, when my father had uh, served as you know and then retired in 1974, and when we knew Saigon was going to fall in April of 75, my father called and arranged to have a special aircraft uh, take uh, fly Admiral Chan and his family out of uh, Saigon uh, to safety. And 
Admiral Chan had assembled his family there, his, his mother and father and, and uh, five of his seven kids. Uh, they were all waiting for the call. The call came in and Admiral Chan looked over, over at his parents who were in tears. Uh, you know, it's just very difficult for them to leave Vietnam. And so he told the, the officer calling, I'm sorry, send the, send the plane uh, with somebody else. I'm, I'm not leaving. And uh, so he stayed behind knowing that, uh, you know, it could well mean his uh, imprisonment if he did. Um, the, when Saigon fell, they immediately started arresting everybody who had been on the other side during the war. And uh, Admiral Chan and two of his sons were arrested. Uh, the one son spent uh, three years in a re-education camp, another spent seven. Admiral Chan spent 12 years in a re-education camp. And the whole time he's in re-edu- re-education camp, uh, uh, since there, there were, uh, we were not recognizing uh, the North Vietnamese government, uh, my father would deal through the International Red Cross in an effort to try and get uh, Admiral Chan released. He was finally released after 12 years, but he was not allowed to leave the country for three more. And so finally, when it was, he was able to, to leave the country and flew to L.A., where most of his family had reestablished there, my father was among those who met him. And uh, again, they, they stayed in very close touch. Uh, and when my father was dying, I was calling Admiral Chan uh, on a regular basis and giving him updates on my father's health. And uh, my, my, the day my father died, I uh, called Admiral Chan. I said, Admiral, this is Jim Zumwalt. And without me saying anything more, he said, your father died, didn't he? And uh, I was shocked. I said, yes, how did you know? He said, last night I had a dream. And he said, your father and I were on a ship and the ship was sinking and your father pushed me out through the hatch and I reached back for him and he waved me off and closed the hatch. And he said, I, I knew something had happened. Uh, and I, again, I, I think that goes to the very close bond they had and the ad, mutual admiration they had for each other. But it, it, it shows you uh, what kind of a relationship my father was able to forge uh, with Admiral Chan. Uh, when my father became CNO, he immediately embarked on what he called Project 60. And Project 60 was a plan he wanted to have presented and on the uh, desk of the Secretary of the Navy within, within 60 days that uh, hit three things. The modernization of the Navy, uh, the what needed to be done to get the Navy for a quality, a quality volunteer force since the draft was likely uh, going to be done away with. And third, what could be done to ensure the Navy could still maintain its mission, uh, missions uh, in the transition to a modern fleet. Uh, my father felt the, the Soviets had a much more modernized fleet than we did that, uh, when he was CNO and uh, worried about the uh, uh, you know, a combat between the uh, the two navies, and one of the things he, he initially, my father initially did was to uh, retire many of the ships that we had that were old, so that that money would not have to be used for maintenance and could go into R and D uh, for the uh, the new ships. He uh, used to kid people that he probably got rid of more American ships than the Japanese Navy did during World War II. Uh, by this by this program, uh, but it did it did pay off. The other things that uh, challenges my father was faced with. Let me just read off some of these. Uh, he knew the U.S. Navy needed changes, uh, and he only had a short time to do so. At most four years, if, if he uh, the CNO was two two year terms and uh, had to be renewed, so he was banking on four years but he was working against an institutionalized mindset that made it very difficult to impose the changes that he did. His, uh, uh, a story was featured on uh, him on Time Magazine in December of 1970, made, made the cover, and it called him a, a dynamic and controversial CNO uh, dra- who was dragging the US Navy kicking and screaming into the 20th century. My, my father's prior years of service had provided him with insights for a lot of the issues that were facing the Navy. Uh, as a detailer at the uh, Bupers, he saw where minorities 
were being given uh, jobs that would basically end their careers. And uh, so he uh, instituted a number of CGRAMs that uh, would address the, the, the uh, hurdles with which minorities were being faced. Uh, Filipinos, for example, the, the only ratings that they were allowed to pursue were uh, as uh, stewards. And so he opened up all ratings uh, to, uh, to stewards. And, and uh, today we have a couple of flag officers who, uh, who are Filipino descent. Um, he, uh, he also set up uh, councils to study what the issues were for uh, uh, blacks and uh, uh, was able to identify a lot of things that were dragging down the, uh, the reenlistment rates. When my father took command of the Navy, the biggest challenge he had, reenlistment was at an all-time low of 9%. And uh, he felt it was absolutely uh, imperative that uh, measures be taken to uh, change things so that it would be more conducive to restoring zest to the Navy and getting people to stay in. The Navy, again, was having to spend money training new people that could go to uh, the R&D for, for ships. Uh, there were three race riots during uh, the period of time that he was uh, CNO, and these uh, basically were used as an opportunity for some of the senior mili military leadership who were opposed to the changes my father was making uh, to try and get him uh, fired as chief of naval operations. Uh, Nixon was very upset when he saw pictures of the, of the rioters on board ship. And my father got a call from uh, Henry Kissinger saying he wanted them all dishonorably discharged, uh, which basically was a illegal order. My father told him that they would go through the justice system just like anybody else and uh, uh, refuse to, uh, uh, to respond to Kissinger's order. Um, by the time my father retired in 1974, reenlistment rates had uh, tripled. Uh, so the impact that he wanted to have on the Navy was, was definitely uh, accomplished. Um, I, I think another thing that shows uh, where my father's head was, was uh, the, uh, what he wanted on his tombstone when uh, he passed. And all he wanted on it was one word, reformer. Uh, if he was to be known for anything in the Navy in his naval career, it was to have reformed a service that needed reformation and to uh, make it a, a better opportunity for those who serve. The, uh, my mother is buried next to him at the U.S. Naval Academy, and uh, she, she gets the last words in her, two words on her students, tombstone that he wanted were his strength. Uh, and that was exactly what she was. It was a, a role she performed during his entire uh, career. Um, uh, some other vignettes that I just thought might be of interest. Um, my, one of the things my father did, he, uh, he opened up the uh, the higher ranks for, for women and there he promoted the first uh, female admiral uh, and he was shown on the news, uh, pinning her two stars on, and not not quite politically correct today, but okay then. He he kissed her after uh, promoting her, and a classmate of my father's immediately wrote him and said, uh, "But I thought I'd never live to see the day that I saw a chief of naval operations kissing another admiral." And uh, my father immediately wrote him back and said. Your friend, you must realize nobody, nobody becomes a chief in naval operations without having kissed a lot of admirals. So uh, my father always tried to turn criticism into, into humor. Uh, that, that humor also came out uh, when he passed away. My, my sister and I went through uh, his files and there were literally thousands and thousands of documents we had to go through. Uh, he was donating them to the Vietnam Center at Texas Tech University. And I came across a three page letter written to him just before he retired. Uh, it came from the deep south from a, a lawyer. And 
this lawyer, uh, it was a scathing letter. He, uh, he said, Admiral, you've been an embarrassment to the Navy. You've maximized the interests of the minor uh, minority to the, to the detriment of the majority and just went on and on. And I was, I was seething as I read through this letter until I got to my father's one sentence response. And he said, uh, dear Mr. Smith, please know that some idiot has written me and signed your name to the letter. So, uh, again, it was a way of uh, dismissing criticism of humor and he never heard back from, uh, from the lawyer. Uh, one of the most touching letters uh, came from a widower. He uh, told my father, reminded him that when he was chief of naval operations, he had uh, uh, the, the widower's wife had sent him a letter, and they had an 18-year-old son who first, had never had an interest in the service, but said he was joining the Navy. And when they asked why, uh, he said that it was because they have a, an animal there who's looking out for the welfare of young people. And so his wife Mary wrote my father to explain her son was doing this, and. and uh, my father immediately wrote her back and said, thank you, keep me posted on his career. And the son stayed in for about 10 years and then, and then got out. And uh, my father and Mary continued the communications over the years until she passed away. And the widower said that, uh, you know, I, I, she kept a stack of letters for you in a drawer in her office. And I just got through going through them. And I, I just want to tell you how much they meant to her. And he said, my my one regret is you never met my Mary and he enclosed a picture of her. Uh, but uh, you know, that's, that's the kind of bond that my father would establish with people. Um, I think as I look back on my father, there are probably two guidelines that he followed. And uh, one of them was that he approached every job in the Navy as his last. And that made him uh, make the right decision rather than worrying about what would uh, be available for him after he finished that job. And uh, you know, whether, whether he was a lieutenant uh, or an admiral, it was always the same. And I think the other principle that guided him was one that he was asked about when uh, a reporter came to see him as he was retiring. And, and comment, Admiral, you know, all the changes you've made in the Navy have, uh, have made you uh, uh, the target of uh, many critics. And uh, my father looked at the reporter and said, I know the changes I made made me a long list of friends and a long list of enemies, and I'm quite proud of both lists. So, uh, you know, again, it was one of these things, you're, you're always going to get criticism, but if you know that you made the right decision, you should have no qualms about it. In 2008, uh, our family was invited to Bath Ironworks to see the commissioning of the USS Stockdale. While we were up there, we were taken over, uh, taken over to see the first uh, piece of steel that had been received by the uh, Bath Ironworks that would go into building the USS Umbral. And while I'm sure that sheet of metal uh, didn't have any further significance to the shipbuilders who would build the, the Zumwalt. Uh, to me, it uh, reflected the medal of a man who was a tremendous naval leader, who was a tremendous humanitarian, and who was uh, an awesome father. I, uh, I was fortunate to observe uh, him in all three capacities. And with that, I'll take uh, whatever questions you have. Jim, thank you very much. And I just can't thank you enough for coming here because you can read a lot about Admiral Zumwalt. In fact, if you look at the history of the Navy over the last hundred years, um, a lot of names jump out at you. Um, Stockdale, Rickover, but Zumwalt is definitely one of them because he was the youngest CNO and of all the things he did for the Navy during the 70s. Um, so I really appreciate because you brought him to life for us. Rather than just reading the book, you told us these personal stories to make it real. But one of the things that I wanted to ask about, um, your father co-wrote a book, uh, My Father, My Son, with, with your brother. And um, it's about um, the relationship that they had. Can you go into a little bit of detail on why they wrote that book and what the impact was for him? Well, uh, for those who may not be familiar, uh, my father, as commander of Naval Forces in Vietnam, ordered the spraying of Asian Orange. And uh, years later, my, my brother, who had served under him as a swift boat commander, uh, and had been exposed to Asian Orange, uh, 
was dying of two cancers uh, as a result of that. And, uh, you know, my father, before using Agent Orange, had checked, checked with the chemical manufacturers and was assured there was no, no harmful effects. Uh, later on, we learned that uh, he had been misled in that regard. But uh, once uh, my brother was diagnosed, uh, the two of them felt it was very important because there had been a, a lawsuit uh, filed by Vietnam veterans uh, against the chemical companies uh, that was uh, settled out of court and really settled for a drop in the bucket because uh, the uh, what the chemical companies knew really was not uh, revealed until my father got involved in, uh, in, in exposing that. But uh, they felt it was important in support of the, of the uh, veterans and uh, their families and so forth to, for their story to be told and uh, felt it was important to, to write it. Um, and, and it is a, a tremendous bond between a, a father and a son. You know, my, my brother said that uh, he's been asked if he ever blamed my father for what he, he did. And my brother said, no, not at all. He said that the, the reason Asian Orange was used was the Navy was experiencing a 72% casualty rate. Uh, in other words, there was a 72 chance you'd be killed or wounded operating in the narrow waterways of Vietnam because the enemy could set up ambushes uh, right on the banks. And uh, uh, you know, by the time a coup, crew could respond to it, they, they had already suffered severe casualties. But if you've seen pictures, uh, once Asian Orange was used, it pushed the uh, vegetation back 100 yards on either bank so that uh, the casualty rate dropped from 72% to 6%. And uh, so, uh, you know, it, it was... It did not take a rocket scientist to recognize that it was important that be done. And my brother realized that uh, he probably would not have survived the Vietnam War had Agent Orange not uh, been employed. And uh, it gave him time to come home, get married, start a family. Uh, and uh, He finally passed away in 1988. But the, the last page of the, the book that they wrote, My Father, My Son, is a very passionate letter that my brother wrote my father. This, to this day, I can't read it without getting tears in my eyes.